Good afternoon, everyone. We're just past two o'clock here in the east. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Construct Connect welcomes you to today's informational webinar entitled Building by Numbers, Using Data to Succeed in Construction. Today's presentation is intended to provide you with a perspective on the information that is key for every construction business to focus on. Whether in your bidding process or in the field, if you aren't fully aware of what the numbers mean or which data to focus on, you're risking significant impacts on the health and potential of your business. Interest in today's webinar has been overwhelming, and as a result, this webinar is being attended by hundreds of contractors from across the country. To ensure everyone has a smooth listening experience, we have placed attendees in listen-only mode. We will gladly answer questions upon completion of today's presentation. If at any time during the webinar you have a question, please use the chat panel on the GoToWebinar interface, and we will respond to your questions at the completion of today's webinar. Joining us today is Bridget Huber, President of Contractor Strategy Consultants. Bridget is a certified public accountant with nearly three decades of experience working with contractors of all types, sizes, and levels of experience. She focuses on helping her clients better understand the inner workings of their business to improve their processes, set strategy, and implement the sound financial practices critical to their success. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Bridget. Thanks, David. Um, welcome, everyone, and thanks to Construct Connect for having me here today and sponsoring this session. My goal today is that each of you will get one or two takeaways that will help increase the success of your company. Maybe you'll get a new way to look at things or be reminded of um, some things that you have let um, go by the wayside that you need to revisit. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, if you visited my website, um, you will see a diagram where I show what I see as a process and flow within an organization. It starts with planning, then the processes, production, and then performance review, and that cycle starts over and is in constant flow. So before you can even begin that cycle, an owner or owners of the company need to understand what their goals are. So if I go into a company and we're doing management strategy sessions, management retreat work, my first question is, how do you define success as an owner? And that differs for many of you across the board. You might be in growth mode. You may want to be growing your top line, expanding geographically. You may be happy with your top line revenue size, but you are more interested in growing your bottom line. You like your crew size. You don't want to buy any more equipment and you just want to focus on taking more to your bottom line. You might be interested in selling your company within the next three years or 10 years. So that knowing that goal um, is important. I'm sorry, one second. I'm going to get you on the right slide here. Knowing that what your goal is as a company is key to the planning and the rest of the processes. Sorry about that, a little technical issue. There we go. So there we are with the slide I just talked about. You're planning your process, production, performance review. But again, set your goals first as an owner, communicate them with management, and then begin this work of aligning uh, your data, your communication, and your processes with those goals. So today we're gonna, while keeping the goals at the forefront, we're gonna look at these areas, key areas, and talk about data, data flow within those. Bidding process. When contractors call me in, sometimes they call me in and the first thing they tell me is they want to look at their job cost and they want me to help them with their job cost. And if we're going to do that, we always take a step back and look at bidding. It's important for you to look at your bid cost each year uh, and know that you have good numbers in the bid. So labor. Um, just a comment on labor. My guess is that many of you take your labor and in order to calculate labor costs, you will look at a pool of workers. So take carpenters, for example. You have a group of carpenters. You may have four carpenters. 
um, you will add, you add up what their hourly rates are, divide those by four to get an average, add your burden and fringe, and use that as your labor rate. I'm going to suggest that there may be another way that you want to look at your labor rates that helps you to absorb some of the downtime that you have in your labor force. A lot of times those costs, those downtime labor costs, are captured in indirect, in your indirect pool. And if we can get some of that cost out of your indirect pool and cover it in labor, uh, it will I think it will help the success of your bids and help you be successful. Into their indirect cost pool, in my opinion, becomes, can be a, become a black hole and can be really um, difficult to manage for a company. So if you look at your labor a little differently, I would take those same four carpenters and I would add up what I paid them in gross wages last year. And I would divide that by their actual chargeable hours, the hours that they were able to bill to a job. That gives you a different look at your labor rate because that gross wage includes their downtime, their overtime. So again, total gross wages for a class of workers divided by their actual billable hours will give you a, a rate that will help cover some of the um, non-charge time. Again, add your burden and fringe in order to get a labor rate. And I, run it both ways. Run the numbers both ways and see how, how things compare. Equipment. Um, people are probably across the board in how they're costing and using equipment costs in bidding. Some use rental rates, some use a version of Blue Book adjusted, and some are doing internally calculated rates. My only suggestion here, no matter what you're using, is that you make sure it's up to date and that you can look at your financial data and know that you're covering your equipment costs. And I'll show you in a financial statement a little later on where you can where you can very easily, an owner or a manager can very easily see by looking at the face of their financial statements whether they're covering their equipment costs. That's the key to that for me. Decide what you're going to use as a methodology and use it, but then don't wait till the end of the year to know if it's, if it's covering what you need it to cover. And finally, overhead and profit. If you're an owner who allows your estimators to submit bids without you having to look at and approve every one, then make sure you've communicated to those estimators what the overhead percent is that needs to go on the job and then what the acceptable profit margins are. You may, you may have a range of acceptable profit percentages that you're willing to let them put on a job. Um, now, I know what some of you might be thinking that when it comes to bidding, there's only one number that you need to know, and that's where you need to be to get the job. And while I understand that and I, I appreciate that, I think it's important to know where you need to be to get a job. It's critical that you know how that number compares to your actual financials. Is that number going to allow you to make profit? <clears throat> Is it going to be a break even for you or will you be losing money? Sometimes ego gets in the way and habit gets in the way and we just start to bid jobs to get them without knowing where that puts us in a financial position. And I've seen too many companies go out of business because they ended up trading checks or not knowing their overhead, not knowing what they had to cover, um, but they just, they had plenty of backlog, they did great work, but they didn't cover their overhead. So just keep those, those numbers in mind. Um, let's see. So back on overhead and margin, I want, we want to monitor that as the year goes on. And I'm going to show you a spreadsheet here that I really like and like to use with my contractors so that they can see how they're working their overhead down to break even. And I always say that's where the fun begins when they get to pick different kinds of jobs and maybe take a little more risk because they know exactly where they are in covering their overhead. And then finally, think about in the bidding process, tracking your bids to win. So if it's a spreadsheet or whatever you're going to use, uh, track every bid that you send out and know some key data about it. What kind of work, where's, what's the geography, who's the owner, who's the GC, the size, and why you didn't get it. That data will be useful for you in the future. So here's the spreadsheet that I use with a lot of my contractors. I, I did not develop it. Um, I have to give credit to FMI. I got it from a friend there, but I like it a lot. So up in the, um, if we focus on the left five columns, the left four columns right now, the top number of 2,161, it's below the blue, highlighted 
that is my budgeted number for overhead for the year. That's my SG&A, so my fixed cost, and then my indirect overhead. When people talk about overhead, at least when I talk about overhead, I talk about two different pools, the indirect production cost, and then your SG&A, your sales general administrative. So if a company, this company budgeted 2,161, that's what they have to cover just to break even. As you start to get jobs or you carry jobs in from the prior year, you're going to start to see how you're working down that nut that, that, that you have to cover. So my first job that I brought in from, from 17 into 18, job 15, 10, 40, um, I expect to make $175,000 on that job, a 15% margin. If I do that, I will have covered, again, 175000 of my overhead, and then this $1,985,000 shows me what I have left to cover. Then you do the work, close the job, and, and the right-hand side is where you've ended up. I had some change orders, so my contract went up, uh, made a little more profit, and got another percentage point on profit, so I've worked, actually covered a little more overhead than I had expected. The other nice thing this spreadsheet does, it takes you right into a gain fade analysis. So on the far right, did, did I gain, you know, gain on the job or was there fade? Some things, these will move around during the course of the year because the job that's lower in the schedule may be, be performed and completed before another. So you may do some jockeying around of the position, but I think it's a great spreadsheet. The other thing this red shows you is if you had to add to your 2,161,000. So, you know, partially through the year, I had to hire some admin. It was a $30,000 budget item. So I have to make sure I take into account any changes to my original budgeted overhead. Once you get, as you work this spreadsheet down and you become closer and closer to zero, that's when I'm saying the fun begins because you covered your overhead, you're starting to make profit, and you can um, make different decisions about the kind of jobs you want to take. It just gives you some freedom and flexibility. This is a higher level analysis of break-even. Break-even is really important to me in terms of, and should be to you, in terms of your company's success. This is a break-even where I just take sales general administrative on the far left. So $802,000 of fixed overhead I have to cover. Across the, the, the um, columns are my gross profit margin after my indirect production cost. So these are a little lower because that's covered now by indirect. The calculation is basically your SG&A divided by your margin tells you what revenue you have to do just to break even. So you can tell just adding a few points to your margin can really impact the pressure of how much you have to do in sales in order to break even. You could make this 802 number, uh, you could add 400,000. You could add your profit goal to that so that you don't lose sight of the fact that this only gets you to break even and you want to do more than that as a company. So add 400,000, add 600,000, whatever that is, and then that'll drive those revenue numbers to show you where you need to be to make certain profit goals. Okay, job handoff. When I talk about job handoff, it's not just what data that needs to go into the field for us to be successful, but what data do we need to give to our sub? What data do we need to transfer to the office, to the accounting staff? in order to have a smooth, successfully run job. So some of those things, goal dates, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but production goals, daily goals. Um, does your field team know every day what their goal is? Today we need to lay this much pipe. We need to hang this much drywall. You know, often it seems obvious, but often that's not communicated uh, to folks on a daily basis. Other key data items are Things like notice of commencement, notice of furnishing, that non-financial data of what are the contact names for people, what's the DIG number in your area, um, you know, just so that there's a smooth flow. If I'm a field worker and I have to stop because I have to, um, I don't have enough wire for to finish something. You know, where am I going to go? Where do we have an account? That those kind of delays can really cause a job profit to tank. So they need to be able to quickly solve their problems by having good data in the field. Uh, we'll talk about the data then that needs to come to accounting for billing purposes and for the data gathering. There's lots of softwares out there. I'm sure you're using lots of different technologies. You know, there's Procore and Slack, things like BuildSafe. 
to help with that document flow and process flow. Um, every year, it's a good opportunity to make sure people are trained. People who have left the company, people who have been added to the company, um, you know, think about whether you have properly trained any new employees to best utilize that technology. Okay. Now, you've handed off data to different people and information to start the job. Now we're going to be gathering data from the field. I still have contractors who use manual timesheets, and I, I'm not judging. I'm just saying maybe this year is the time to think about using technology to get uh, your, your hours, equipment hours, and job hours, um, labor hours and equipment hours back into the office and into your job cost system. The technology has gotten so easy to use, so user-friendly for people to be able to record their time. Um, think about that opportunity. Um, and don't let naysayers drag you down on that. I have a client right now, so I talk about implementing change, kind of a negative incentive. I have a client right now who they've moved to electronic um, time entry. It's all done on their phones. You're able to, through the accounting software, push out certain crews, get certain job phases and categories. It's very controlled and, and um, helps eliminate mistakes. There's one gentleman who's been there forever who says he just can't do it. He's not going to do it. He's going to do his manual timesheet until he retires. Well, my thought on that is, with all due respect, the negative incentive is this is what the company is doing. This is how you get paid. If you want to get paid, jump on board. Um, balanced scorecard is another way to incentivize people to um, maybe embrace change or to do parts of their job that they often have thought weren't as important. So a good example is a project manager. If you're uh, evaluating your project managers, think about evaluating them on more than just job performance. The balanced scorecard, which probably many of you are aware of, gives you four or five factors that you're going to evaluate someone on, um, and job productivity or success is one of them, but relationships with owners, relationships with office personnel, um, timeliness of, of data transfer, those are things that you can use on their scorecard in order to evaluate their overall performance. So if you're going to think about new technology, one um, idea or one suggestion is to pick some champions in your company, whether they're the supervisors or project managers or certain field personnel who you feel will be really positive about the change, will be open with you in communicating problems so that you can work out any bugs with a small group, a test group, before you roll it out to the, to the entire company. It will just increase your chance of success. And then they will know it that much better, and they'll be able to help others once you roll it out to the entire company. Okay, so again, um, thinking about what the practical way to gather data, we talked about technology. The other practical thing to think about, and we're going to go back to the bid for a minute, when you bid a job, often you bid at a very detailed level. Um, and that's important to get your numbers to where you need them to be and to really understand the job. You're breaking apart the plan and putting together the bid. That might not be the best way to gather the field data. So be careful that you're not just taking your bid and pushing it into your accounting system and then pushing it out to the field and trying to get them to record hours in, for equipment and labor at a very detailed level that might not be practical for a field worker. And I hope that makes sense. What I'm trying to say is you may have, you may have your bid set up in ways that once the guys are working, they wouldn't even know where to stop and start their time to, to get the hours recorded to match the bid line. Look at your bid before you, again, before you send it out to the field in the work order and before you put it in the accounting system. And there's probably, there may be some consolidation of lines and phases that need to be done so that you're being most efficient in, in how you gather the data and how they're able to do the job. Equipment hours, you know, just make an internal decision. Are you just recording active equipment or is it, is there an idle? Uh, equipment rate that you're using as well and communicate that to everyone. Change orders. Uh, don't assume that everyone knows the best in the company's way of documenting and getting appropriate approvals and moving change orders through the process. Um, I've had two cases in the past year where unfortunately owners have lost key personnel in their business for different reasons and they had the owners had to dive back in and really get involved in the details again and they were surprised in both cases at 
the fact that processes weren't going as they had thought they were, as they thought they had communicated, as they thought things were happening. And often it's in the change order arena where things can break down, and that's, that's a loss of money very quickly. Okay, once you roll out new procedures, make sure you're monitoring the data, that you have good controls, checks and balances um, for the incoming data for its accuracy, and then review the efficiency of your processes. I always say don't be afraid to roll out a new process for fear that there's going to be something that goes wrong. I would just assume that something will go wrong, but be honest and open with your people and say, hey, we really believe in this. We really think it's going to be good in the long run for the company. Uh, we welcome your feedback and then and, and be uh, open to their ideas and suggestions. Okay. Selling processes. When and how much? So the key here is the time of communication between the office and the PM. The office staff sometimes doesn't know a new job has started until they get a timesheet that has a job on it and it's not yet been set up in the accounting system. Um, they don't know anything about it, there's no budget. Don't let that happen in your organization. Again, it was back on that contract handoff. Make sure everybody's getting the data they need to know when a job starts. Um, I have GCs who they'll call, the accounting department will call their subs the week ahead of when sub invoices are due to make sure that's all flowing and the billing runs smoothly. And subs don't miss those key billing dates. If it's 25th of the month, you need to get your AIA submitted. Um, and submit them properly the first time. Now, have a good method for getting your waivers and your affidavits all together, all organized, notarized, and send them in with the billing. And communicate change orders. If you're able to do it, a weekly meeting or a monthly billing meeting where the accounting staff and the project managers are in the same room talking about all the jobs and key change orders is really helpful to have everybody in the room and understanding what, what is able to be billed. The longer you hold out on billing a change order, the harder it is to collect it. Everybody's memories get fuzzy, um, so capture those as quickly as you can. So again, what triggers the billing process? They need to know that it's time to bill and how much to bill. And then who's doing it? Who's responsible? Some companies are small enough that the, that the PMs themselves go in and do the billing in the accounting system. I don't have an opinion or preference on how it's done as long as everybody knows the expectation and that you keep it moving. The accounting department prepares the bill, but the PMs have to review it. Let's not have it sit on somebody's desk or in somebody's uh, email or queue for too long. Keep that process moving. Okay. Job cost data. What do you need to know during and after the job? During the job, if your jobs are, go on for a long a longer period of time over months, years. Um, revised estimates are key to knowing where you are in the job and avoiding profit phase. They're also key to billing um, for WIP schedules and knowing whether you're over or under billed on a job. If you have bonded work, uh, those financial statements that you're submitting to your bonding company, your insurance company, and probably your banks, they're going to be looking for the work in progress adjustment. Um, and if there's significant under or over billings, those are red flags for them in different ways. So make sure you have good information on your estimates. Again, maybe the PMs are able to go into the accounting software and do all that themselves. If not, I have a client where we do a monthly meeting. I have one tomorrow, as a matter of fact, scheduled to sit down with the PMs and go over where they are on all their jobs and get the revised estimates up to date. Um, and then after the job, it goes back to the planning, you know, it goes back to what do you need to know about your job to know if you're successful. So a lot of owners have that information in their head. They know if we do, again, this much pipe, manual feed in a month, we're going to be good. If we have this many hours, labor hours that we're able to charge to jobs, we know we're going to be successful. But let's start, you know, think about starting to document that for others in the management team so that you're transferring that information out of your head and out of your knowledge base that others can help better understand and help you be successful. Um, these items are only trackable if back in the planning phase you talked about them and you knew your goals and you had the proper um, processes in place to get this data. At a company level, 
Again, it's that average profit margin. How are we doing against our break even? Again, at the company level, how, what kind of financial statements do you want? You could have a divisional profit and loss statement, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, you might have commercial work. You might have residential work. You might have service work. Do you want to see your data? Do you want to see a profit and loss at each of those levels? Accounting systems are so robust and so sophisticated anymore that you can put in fields to track by PM, by type, by ge geography, so many different ways. So think about how you're going to want to slice and dice your data. Um, one, one I mentioned here is tracking warranty by superintendent. That's sometimes a meaningful number that people don't think to track, but you could set up 2018 job for each of your supers and record all warranty costs into those jobs and might get some meaningful information there. If you're going to do full P&Ls down at the, the bottom line, net profit level, you may have some allocations that you need to think about. Not a huge fan of this. Um, if, the, if the allocations begin to seem arbitrary, um, just think about, is it worth, what do you, what's your goal by allocating rent and office staff and all those things across your divisions? Is it really telling you anything or is the more important data really at the gross profit margin level? Okay, so here is the statement I just talked about, a financial statement. You have your commercial, residential, service, and then total. I like this. I like it, again, all the way to the um, gross profit margin level or even after indirect production costs, which you can't see on here. But what I wanted to show you on here is what I talked about before in equipment. This is a case where this is the top dollar amount. Or if you go over to the $52,000 number on the total column in yellow, that's the amount of equipment, hours, dollars. So that's the equipment dollars that were charged to your job in that month. And then down below, you show it as what we call a contra account, or as you show it as being applied against your actual equipment costs. So you have your pool of equipment costs. You were able to charge 52,000 of those to jobs and get paid for them. So that shows you right now on the face of the statement, you are $36,000 under applied. You have not covered your actual equipment cost by $36,000. Um, and that, you know, you need to watch that. So is it, you know, is a lot of equipment sitting around or, or you're, did you bid bad numbers and charge, you're charging too low for your equipment? That's the kind of thing that you can see it right on the face of the financials. It stares at you every month um, for you to make some decisions on. So I'll just close by saying that a lot of you are in different places, in different sophistication levels. And if there's any new processes, any new data that you want to gather, I encourage you to think about, I like to use this slide at the end of presentations to think about best practice, kind of, if I had unlimited resources of people and money, what, what do I want, what would my process look like? So in the case we're trying to get to the top of a summit, on the far left, if I had no limits in, in those things and those resources, this is how I would do it. You may not be there, so okay, so middle section is what can I do, given what I have, given my talent pool, um, given any limitations and constraints that I have, how can we do it, still make it work for us, and be successful? The far right are those people who tell you every reason that you can't do something, and I encourage you to not listen to those folks and to really stay focused on that middle ground of where are we as a company, who are we, and how can we have best practices in place that are uh, relevant and applicable to us? Um, the people who are the naysayers, naysayers, if you like them, coach them up. If they can't coach them up, then help them find a, another place to be successful. That's all I have. We're going to see if we have any questions. I'm going to turn this over to someone more technologically savvy than myself. Oh, sorry. I was sorry on that whole time. There was a couple questions out there. Somebody asked about the dig number on one of my slides. That in, in Ohio, where we are, if you're going to dig in the ground, you have to call Ohio Digs first. So they will come out and mark all the utilities that are underground. So that's just one of those, again, non-financial numbers, but something important for field people to know. There was another question about how do you um, deal with or address PMs or superintendents who aren't getting on board with you with regard to technology. and you know, I'll just say it's like having kids. You know, you gotta be consistent and you have to enforce one of those choose your battles, I think. So I do 
you know, there's lots of different kinds of employees. You have some of those who are out there kind of the cowboys are out there doing their own thing and they make a lot of money for you. I get it. I get that you may not cut them loose, but, but where, where are the pain points and, and what battles are you going to pick to get them on board? Um, as an accounting staff person, sometimes it's difficult to appreciate why an owner is keeping that rogue project manager on staff when they're, they make it impossible for you to do your job, but, but there may be reasons. They may be great with customers. They may do great work. Um, but you know, try to get the support of ownership in, in where you need help um, with things that are really making it hard for you to do your job. There's some questions about getting a copy of the slideshow. Certainly, we can I think we can do that, right? David, get that in their hands. Yes, we have been recording, so we will send a copy out to everyone who has attended today just so that you can look at it a little bit more closely. If you have questions specifically, um, it will have Bridget's contact information in there. She's more than willing to uh, you know, reach back out to you and answer any questions you may have. Yeah, and if any of you want those, those Excel, you know, some of those things were actually Excel documents with the break-even and the um, backlog that showed you working towards break-even, please email me. Um, I think there's one more slide that has my email information again if we advance one slide. Um, and you, so it's, it'll be, if we send the slides, it'll be at the front and back of the slides will be my email. My website is the same with the www in front of it. Um, and I'm, there it is. So I'm glad to, to answer any questions and, and get into your hands any spreadsheets uh, that you might need or want. Let's see. Am I affiliated with? No, I am not affiliated with, I think that says FMI. Um, no, I've worked with them in, in different ways in the past. I have my own consulting business, so I do management strategy. And um, with a, you know, obviously I'm a CPA, I have a, a lean towards the financial side, but I'll also do human kind of um, consulting, helping owners look at their staff and if they have the right people in the, you know, as they say, the right people in the right seats on the bus. Um, I do that kind of work, but no affiliation. Um, how does the PM get the leadership ownership team to uh, make a technical transition? So it sounds like the case where the project manager is trying to get the owners, those above, to buy into technology. That can be a tough one. Um, I think if you can, if you're able to equate it to dollars and cents or something that helps their life, um, make their life easier, that's obviously the best way to sell that. Uh, you might have to show them the kind of data that you could be able to provide them if you do make this technology change, or on the converse side, what are we potentially losing out on as a company by not making these technology transitions? There's a lot out there in safety, not related to getting off topic, but there's a ton of technology out there in safety right now that, um, you know, it's, it's more about what are you missing by not doing, the, doing these technological advancements. It looks like we have covered everything that has come in. Um, again, if you have questions that come up later, if there's something you can think of that you would like to have Bridget answer, she'd be more than willing to, you know, work with you. Um, we appreciate your time today. And again, if you have questions for us, you can respond back afterwards when you receive the copy of the video. Uh, or Bridget's contact information will be in that deck. You can reach out to her as well. Uh, thank you for your time today.